I'd like to say I'm honored to be here with the students, with the family, with the uh, faculty and administration of the university here on such a big and important day for all of you. Uh, and of course, I want to pass on my congratulations to the graduates that are here on the floor in front of me. Uh, as I look out at the audience, I'm thinking back to the day about 30 years ago when I was sitting in your chair, uh, super excited to get my diploma and go take on the world. Now, uh, I remember thinking at the time, this is a good time to graduate with an engineering degree. But as I sit here today, this is an amazing time to enter the workforce with an engineering degree. So let me tell you a little bit about you know, why I think that and how I got here. As the dean mentioned, I'm a mechanical engineer who uh, came from very humble beginnings. Again, born and raised on a Midwestern dairy farm where we had cattle and crops and because of that, a lot of machinery. And probably like any farm boy who grew up in that type of environment, I became very adept at uh, not only operating but fixing and maintaining this type of equipment. Taking it apart, figuring out how is it supposed to work, what's wrong with it, trying to fix it and, uh, and put it all back together. I grew up in an environment that was like my own maker lab or my own epic center where I had so much hands-on exposure. And I enjoyed tinkering with equipment and machines so much that I remember very distinctly the first purchase I ever made with my own money was a set of Craftsman wrenches that I purchased when I was 12 because my father told me to stop using his. <laughs> now fortunately, I was also very good at math and science. And uh, I remember back when I was in high school, the dean mentioned I have uh, seven siblings. Well, that includes six older sisters, which is... Uh, a configuration I wouldn't necessarily recommend for anybody. <laughs> but anyway, my second sister, who was about six years older than I, uh, graduated as a civil engineer. And to be frank, I didn't know that much what engineering meant. But I do remember when she got her first job and we're sitting around the family table talking about her job and she told us how much money she made. And uh, essentially, on her first day in the job, she made as much money as my parents did. So at that point in time, farming was out the window. I was going to be a mechanical engineer. Now, uh, back then, 30 years ago, something else was happening, and that is that computers, in particular personal computers, were coming onto the scene. And uh, I was introduced to computers as a senior in high school when we had a brand new lab with two Apple IIe personal computers in it. And at the time, very few people had exposure to computers, so I was amongst the first. And as soon as I played with this technology, it really captured my attention, and I knew this was going to be important. So uh, the following fall, when I headed off to the university to get my mechanical engineering degree, I decided to specialize in how to use computers and software to solve mechanical engineering problems. Now that focus on what happens when digital meets physical has served me very well through the 30 years of my career and has really led me to become the CEO of one of the world's largest industrial software companies who really provides primarily engineering software. So uh, for much of my career, including the time I spent at PTC, which is uh, going on a couple of decades now, I've been focused on creating software that helps you to uh, model and simulate physical products. Things like planes, trains, and automobiles. And uh, that's the software categories like computer-aided design and, and product lifecycle management, which incidentally are software categories, big software categories, that were started and to this day thrive here in Boston, not out in Silicon Valley. So 30 years ago, when PTC's founder started the company, he came up with the idea of parametric solid modeling, 3D solid modeling, that would allow an engineer to create a complete digital prototype of a phys physical product. You could model the parts and put the parts together into assemblies and systems and ultimately complete products. And you could show your ideas to other engineers and iterate, maybe show them to the customer or the product manager, and really get this design just perfect, at which point you walked it down to the factory and said, Make me one of these, okay? But along the way, uh, something happened, and that simple story is a fading memory, because what happened is that the digital technology 
wasn't just used to describe the product anymore. It became part of the product. And this really turned the whole engineering process a bit on its ear. The next car you buy, for example, there will have been more hours of engineering invested in the digital parts than in the physical parts of that car. So this uh, infusion of digital content into you know, physical products and enabled the products to become smarter with smarter control systems and uh, better user interfaces. In a second generation, we could connect those products to a network and that gave us the Internet of Things. And uh, that Internet of Things allowed us to remotely monitor and control and optimize products. We could use data science and uh, analytics and artificial intelligence to make the products more effective. Uh, and we're at the point now where just about every product being manufactured is a combination of digital and physical content with frankly the, the focus, the epicenter shifting slowly toward the digital side as more of the effort goes in there and more of the value uh, is created there. So maybe for parents, if you think about it, a uh, hundred years ago, if you think of a refrigerator, a hundred years ago a refrigerator was a wooden box with a chunk of ice in it. And today, if you think about a refrigerator, it's a uh, system that involves mechanical packaging, it's got thermodynamics and fluid mechanics, there's a discussion about microprocessor design and embedded systems and wireless connectivity and analytics or artificial intelligence. Of course, we have to talk about security and user experience and all of that just in a refrigerator. It's been an amazing progression of, uh, of technology. But really, we're just getting started with this amazing progression of technology. As I look across all the different fields that my 30,000 customers operate in, I see everything becoming digitized and virtualized. It's becoming wireless and mobile, intelligent and predictive, and optimized and robotized and sometimes even given autonomy to start making its own decision. It's really an amazing time. Plus now, we're also producing products in surprising new ways like 3D printing or additive manufacturing. We can use additive manufacturing to print titanium parts whose shape and design was generated by artificial intelligence algorithms. We can print cells into biological organs. And when it's time for a break, maybe even print our favorite food for lunch. It isn't really the case, though, that there is an amazing technology happening here. In fact, there are like a dozen very big technological trends, each accelerating faster and faster. And they're now coming together and colliding in a nexus that really represents a fundamental and massive force of disruption and transformation. One of my favorite uh, futurist authors, a guy named Gerd Leonhard, has a saying that humanity will change more in the next 20 years than it has in the last 300 years. Now that's a bold prediction given the amount of unbelievable change that humanity has experienced in the last 300 years, if you think about it. But frankly, I agree with that point of view. Which brings me back to the BU College of Engineering graduating class that sits in front of me because you're at the epicenter of all of that change. You're graduating at a truly amazing time in history, a time of unprecedented technological change. When the economy is strong and engineering jobs are plentiful and the pay is higher than ever. Perhaps someday we'll look back and think this actually was the golden age of engineering. In another interest, interesting twist, if I look at this as an employer of engineers now, there's something interesting happening. And that is that technology is moving so fast and you were just schooled in the latest technologies and methodologies, there's a very good chance that when you join your new, your new company, on your first day on the job, you're going to be the company's very best expert at what it is that you focused on. We're at this amazing place where actually, in many technical fields, expertise has become inversely proportional to seniority. Now, enjoy that for the moment. 
uh, but then work hard to stay on top of things because as you get more seniority, you're going to find out that other people, you know, coming in under you have learned newer and greater things than, than you learned last time you had the opportunity to focus uh, just on learning. So you need to be aware, however, that it's not all great. In fact, there's a growing pessimism about all this technology and all the experts behind it. You know, people who lost their jobs to automation don't really think this technology is that great after all. In fact, uh, we seem to be segregating into the haves and the have-nots. The haves are people like you and myself who really understand technology and have been able to harness it and master the machines. And the have-nots are people who are losing their jobs to the automation that we've created while trying to drive productivity and, and cost savings. And because of the imbalance of wealth that this situation is creating, the tech industry has a growing image problem. And it's actually becoming a bit dangerous. So we as engineers have to adjust our approach. First, I think we have to think about how we can help humans better leverage their natural strengths to compare more favorably with all the automation that's being designed to replace them. And second, we have to make sure that we're putting the power of our machines to work in ways that benefit the quality of life for people. So on the first point, rather than just thinking about man versus machine, I see it as a triangle of physical, digital, and human capabilities. Each capability is unique and powerful in its own right. So the goal in each situation to be find the right, the optimal balance of physical, digital, and human capabilities taking into account the respective strengths. For example, physical machines are strong and tireless. They just work and work and work. Uh, digital computers can calculate and store and move and process data at lightning speeds. But humans alone possess the powers of innovation and creativity and problem solving. And of course, they have very interesting sensory and motor skill systems as well. So this triangle of digital, physical, and human has three lines in it, of course. Now the line that connects human and physical, well, that was designed by Mother Nature. Mother Nature created humans to interact with the physical world, so that works pretty well. And the line between physical and digital, thanks to IoT and analytics and artificial intelligence and connectivity and all those things I've been talking about, that has advanced dramatically as machines have become smart and connected. But the line that connects humans to dig digital information is relatively primitive, and I'd argue it hasn't changed much in three decades, because the app you run on your cell phone looks a lot like the Windows 3.1 app I used to run on my computer before you were born. So we've not made a lot of progress there. So we have to figure out how to balance all the improvements and advancements that machines have enjoyed thanks to digital technology by figuring out a better way to pass some of that capability onto humans as well. Now, unfortunately, humans don't have a port that you can plug an ethernet cable into. So we have to figure out new ways to pass digital information onto humans. And I think there's a real breakthrough here called augmented reality, or AR. And it's one of the things that I and PTC are really working to promote and to advance. By the way, the AR technology at PTC is run by a BU College of Engineering alum named Michael Campbell, who's a very, very talented mechanical engineer who has embraced all this digital power and is really working at the cutting edge of our technology development efforts. So if you think about it, augmented reality means augmenting God-given human capabilities with a digital overlay. Now that sounds a little bit odd or extreme, but if you think about it, what does a hearing aid do? Well, a hearing aid is the little piece of digital technology that augments your hearing. So now I'm talking about like smart glasses that augment your vision so that when you interact with the world, you're seeing a combination of physical and digital information with the digital information frequently being made to be just part of the scenery. So you can ingest it and process it and go to work on it as you would any other form of analog information coming from the digital or from the physical world. Now the reason PTC has focused so much on AR of late is because we see it as a great equalizer. It allows people to become smart and connected. 
and to more directly benefit from the power of the cloud and artificial intelligence and so forth. So AR, for example, makes workers 30 to 50 percent more productive when doing technical work that has to be done quickly and accurately. I think it changes the balance. But I challenge all the graduates here to think about all the different ways that we could use digital technology to make humans more powerful rather than just use that digital technology to make better robots to replace them. Now coming back to the second and the, perhaps the more uh, important response to the pessimism I spoke of, I think we need as engineers to elevate our focus a little higher than just productivity and cost savings. And we need to apply a good portion of our intellectual energy toward in innovations that improve the quality of life of people. And pursuing this line of thinking brings me right back to Dean Lutchen's vision of the societal engineer who combines quantitative and creative problem solving skills with the ability to communicate effectively with systems level thinking and global awareness, with a passion for innovation, an awareness of public policy and a social consciousness and appreciation for the need to improve the quality of life while creating jobs and economic opportunity. Now I'm sure you've heard that a thousand times, but I have to say, I love that vision. I think in the world of smart connected people and smart connected products, you have here a real differentiator not just to help you find the job you want, but to find a job that makes you happy for the rest of your career. So we're relying on you and what you've learned here as societal engineers to help create a safer, more sustainable, healthier, more productive world with enough food and water and opportunity for all. There's never been a better time in history for graduating engineers than this very moment. In a period of unprecedented technological change, you're at the cutting edge of the latest technologies and methodologies, and the job market's strong. As societal engineers, you're well armed to make a difference, to improve the quality of life in the world around you, while having a prosperous career. There's so much going on for you, and it's my hope, too, that the Boston University College of Engineering class of 2018 can show the rest of the world how it should be done. So with that, I'd like to say thank you again for this opportunity to share some of my thoughts and ideas with you, and more importantly, congratulate the, uh, congratulate the class, the graduating class of 2018. I know how hard it is to get an engineering degree, and I know how proud you must feel at this moment. So thank you very much.